Welcome back to the second half of this um, uh, you know, tutorial on quantum digital quantum simulation algorithms. So um, you know, before the break, we were talking about product formula simulations. So what I would like to do now is just talk briefly about how we can use these simulations to simulate sparse Hamiltonians, this kind of more general model of um, you know, kind of efficiently simulate simulatable Hamiltonians. Um, and then we'll move on to talk about post-trotter uh, simulation methods and, and a few other things. So, um, so how can we simulate these sparse Hamiltonians? So recall that a Hamiltonian is sparse if it has not too many non-zero entries in any given row, and you can get a handle on where those entries are and what their values are. So the kind of general strategy for being able to simulate these Hamiltonians efficiently um, relies on edge coloring. So the idea is we want to produce an assignment of colors uh, to the edges of the graph um, that is you know, a valid coloring in the sense that um, two edges that are incident on the same vertex are assigned, uh, if they're different edges, they're assigned different colors. Um, and the advantage of having an edge coloring of, of this graph is that it can, kind of breaks up the simulation into small pieces that um, will be sort of easier to handle, right? So, and just so it's clear, what is this graph? What I mean by the graph of the Hamiltonian I mean the graph of like the non-zero matrix elements of the Hamiltonian, right? So um, I have a vertex for every computational basis state, and I put an edge between two vertices if there's a non-zero matrix element between them, right? And because we have a sparse Hamiltonian, this graph is sparse, right? It, it's, it has not too many, um, you know, the, the, the degrees of the vertices are not too big, right? If it's a D sparse Hamiltonian, then the maximum degree of any vertex is, is you know, at most D. Okay, so why is this useful? So imagine I have some graph here. We just got some, you know, five-dimensional space. So we have this this graph, but you could imagine it's a much larger one. Um, and now what I do is I, I somehow, you know, find some way of assigning colors to the edges. Um, so hopefully you can see that I have, you know, red, blue, and green edges now. Um, and um, now if I look at the subgraph that I get by just taking the, I take all the vertices, but I take just the edges of a given color, then those graphs involve just um, isolated vertices and isolated edges, right? That's just a property of, of an edge coloring that, you know, I can't have a path of, you know, length any longer than one, because if I did that, I would, I, would I would violate the coloring constraint, right? So if I have this edge coloring, then, um, you know, that sort of breaks up the simulation into some really nice pieces, because I, I only have evolution within two-dimensional subspaces. And you can probably imagine that I could sort, sort of like, you know, um, find some way of efficiently simulating the evolution within all of these two-dimensional subspaces. Um, and then I can use product formulas to sum up these individual terms to give a simulation of the overall Hamiltonian dynamics. So now the only question is, how do you come up with this edge coloring using only local information, right? Because remember, what we have is not a global picture of what the graph is, but rather just a black box that tells us for a given vertex, what are its neighbors, right? What are the, where are the non-zero entries in that row of the matrix, right? Those are like the neighbors in the graph. Um, and it turns out that you can come up with an, a nice edge coloring of a, of a graph using only local information, and that allows you to produce efficient simulations of these sparse Hamiltonians. Um, so in particular, here's some, you know, kind of um, nice simple fact. If I, um, if I have a bipartite graph, Right? So that means a graph that I can sort of where I can divide the vertices into two parts. So the edges only go across the bipartition and they don't go between vertices within um, one of the parts. That um, if I have maximum degree D, then I can come up with an edge coloring that uses only D squared colors. Um, and I can compute what that coloring is using only this local information. Um, so let me just like kind of very briefly say what the idea is. Um, let me write, you know, IDX of U comma V to mean the index of V in the neighbor list of U, right? So that's exactly the kind of information I can get from this, um, you know, sparse Hamiltonian representation. It tells me like, you know, what is the, the um, neighbor of a given index, right? So I can compute what these indices are. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna assign a color to the edge UV to just be the index of V in the list of U um, as kind of the first part of this, of this ordered pair. And then for the second part, the index of U in the neighbor list of V. And I claim that if I do that, well, so first of all, that definitely uses only D squared colors, right? Because there's at most D neighbors. So these indices run, run from one through D. Um, so this uses only uh, D squared colors. And then I claim it's a valid edge coloring. And that's basically just, you can just check, check. you know, that somehow yeah, if you look at two edges, edges and they have different edges, edges um, then they have to have different colors, right? Or to put it another way, like the way it's explained here in this proof, if I look at edges UV and UW, if they have the same color, 
then it must actually be that V equals W, right? So I don't know, maybe, maybe it's a little bit early in the morning to sort of like um, uh, parse the rest of the proof, but it's kind of all written here. It's not a, it's not a complicated argument. Okay, and so this was just for bipartite graphs, but this is sort of without loss of generality because you can always sort of like embed things into a larger space so that the graph is bipartite, right? If you just sort of tensor H with sigma X, then that's a Hamiltonian that's bipartite and you can simulate it if you just put the, you know, in this new Ancelic qubit that you've added, you just put a plus state, then somehow the evolution there is gonna be exactly the same as the evolution of H on the actual input state. Right? so there's actually no loss of generality in just assuming the graph is bipartite. Yes? Is there a theorem for how many coils are necessary for not locally immutable? Oh yeah, yeah. So right. So um, uh, so I think it's um, at most d plus one, right? This is I guess it's called Weising's theorem. So I think in general you can get by with um, you know potentially many fewer than this. Although yeah, I'm not sure what exactly the limits are and how low you can get this number um, uh, if you require it to be locally computable. I mean, of course. There's no, this uses only information about the nearest neighbors. You could also ask what happens if you go to sort of next nearest neighbors and maybe if you consider just some pretty small neighborhood, maybe you could reduce the number of colors. Maybe there's some trade off there. So there's maybe questions to explore. I don't know exactly what the full picture is though. Okay, thanks. Yeah, good question. Yes. Oh, why this isn't, why this isn't, why there's no loss of generality? Yeah, 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 sorry, sorry, this H is not a Hadamard, this H is the Hamiltonian. Yeah, maybe that's uh, sketches too. Yeah, so what, what I have in mind is this. Sorry, it's probably too telegraphic on the slide. So what I imagine is that I'm going to replace the Hamiltonian with sigma x tensor H, right? And that's just like H, uh, you know, H, right? So this is the, um, this is the, the Hamiltonian that I'm actually going to simulate. Um, and so, so this is like the given Hamiltonian, right? But this is now the new Hamiltonian I constructed that's going to be the one I'm going to simulate. And this is now bipartite because somehow there's the, there's the vertices. This is like the one part of the bipartition. This is the other part of the bipartition. Things only go across, right? This is the zero one. Yeah. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay, great. All right, so um, yeah, that just sort of like um, explains how it is that you can simulate these sparse Hamiltonians. So what I want to do now is I want to go on to talk about these kind of post-trotter post methods, right? So, um, you know, this, this idea of a product formula simulation, you know, really was, I mean, I guess he didn't talk explicitly about higher order formulas, but kind of the basic idea was already there in this paper from, you know, Seth Lloyd, like more than 25 years ago. Um, but just in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, there have been a lot of other Hamiltonian simulation methods that have been developed that achieve better performance um, you know, uh, definitely asymptotically, and maybe even there are cases where uh, it's worth uh, deploying these methods in, uh, you know, in practice. So there's there's a lot of lot of sort of new ideas for Hamiltonian simulation that have been developed, um, and so that's what I want to tell you about in, in this part of the of the lecture. Okay, and these these uh, methods have been kind of motivated by kind of some kind of specific theoretical questions about the, the limits of the asymptotic scaling of um, you know, the cost of Hamiltonian simulation. And so that, um, that's how I'm going to sort of like describe things here. And let's, let's first talk about the problem of um, the time dependence of simulation. So remember, we have this no fast forwarding theorem that says that somehow linear in T, if you want to evolve the time T, linear in T should be a, the best you can possibly do, right? So that, so, um, so that's that's sort of like a limit that we that we don't um, don't hope to get below. But you know, from the simulations based on product formulas that we've talked about so far, we're not there yet, right? So the the simulation of um, you know using a using a um, two case order product formula gives a complexity that scales like t to the one plus one over two k. And as we discussed before, you know this is like close to linear in t for large k. But you but can't you get can't that close to linear in T because of this exponential in K prefactor. Um, and it's just kind of messy, right? I mean, somehow, you know, it feels like kind of linear time simulation, you know, maybe ought to be possible. Um, so, you know, can we actually do that? Can we get an algorithm that has complexity that's just linear in T, like as a kind of a clean, you know, answer to this question? And, you know, on the one hand, you might think this ought to be possible because, you know, a system that has that Hamiltonian somehow 
to evolve for time t, it's just taking time t, right? I mean, they sort of, it's simulating its own dynamics in real time. So like, why should you have to take time, you know, longer than t? On the other hand, you know, there is some kind of translation that happens in going from Hamiltonian dynamics, um, you know, just as it might occur to a simulation, right? That we're talking about simulations on, you know, digital computers using some discrete circuit model and somehow we're mapping this continuous time evolution into something discrete. So maybe somehow that mismatch is the reason for this like extra slightly super linear, you know, behavior. And maybe that somehow is inevitable. But it turns out that it's not inevitable. It turns out you can give algorithms really in the kind of, you know, circuit model that do simulation with a number of gates. It's really just linear in T. So I'm going to explain sort of the first method that was developed to show that. And then and just as kind of like, like sort of some background, background. And then later, later on, we'll talk about other methods that are sort of like, um, uh, you know, better, better in other ways. Okay, so the kind of first method that was developed that showed how to do this um, was based on ideas of um, discrete time quantum walks. Um, and I'm not going to, because there are other methods that have sort of like, um, yeah, I guess, perform better than this method, both in, both in terms of getting better trade-offs with respect to other parameters, and also just in terms of performing better in practice. I don't want to dwell a lot on this method, but I just want to sort of mention the main ideas between uh, behind how this Hamiltonian simulation algorithm is going. So what we can do is we can define a sort of a, a discrete operation, a unitary operation that does something kind of related to the Hamiltonian um, that will allow us to give this linear time simulation. So this unitary operation we're going to define is uh, what you might call a quantum walk, a discrete time quantum walk corresponding to the Hamiltonian. And it's kind of like a sort of, sort of um, kind of souped up version of what happens in Grover's algorithm, if you know Grover's algorithm, right? Grover's algorithm alternates between two reflections one of them is the reflection about the marked state, and the other is a reflection about the um, initial state, right? And by alternating between these two reflections, we sort of rotate toward the marked item. Well, this quantum walk is also a product of two reflections. What we're going to do is we're alternately going to, um, uh, so, okay, so first of all, we're going to augment the space. We're going to have two copies of the state space that the Hamiltonian acts on. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to reflect about a certain subspace, that subspace is some subspace that encodes information about the Hamiltonian. It's going to be the span of these states psi j, where the state psi j is like um, on the first register, just the computational basis state j. And on the second register, it's some superposition over the neighbors of j um, with, with uh, amplitudes that encode the square roots of the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian. And there's this complex conjugate in there for some kind of technical reason. But it's some kind of state you can write down that sort of looks at some particular row of the, of the Hamiltonian. It encodes into it you know, some information about the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian in that row. Um, and then we look at the subspace we get by taking the span of all of those states. Um, and then, so that's one of the reflections that we're going to do. The other reflection we're going to do is going to be a swap of these two registers that you can show as a reflection in Hilbert space also. And um, so that's, that's what we're going to do. And this is, this construction may seem really bizarre, um, but this is kind of like a natural generalization of a kind of discrete time quantum walk prescription that was given by Mario Segeti in, in defining quantum walks on graphs. It's kind of a natural generalization of that to um, trying to uh, put information about the Hamiltonian into the definition of the walk operator. Um, and so what's nice about this is that this operation is easy to implement. So if we have a sparse Hamiltonian, so there's not too many, you know, uh, entries in this superposition because there's not too many entries in the corresponding, uh, you know, row of the Hamiltonian, then this, this thing is easy to implement. So you can, you can use just a small number of queries to the black box description of the sparse Hamiltonian to implement the reflection um, about the span of these states. It's something that's you know, relatively easy to do in terms of the number of queries to the, the black box description of the Hamiltonian. And furthermore, this operator, you know, it has information in it about the Hamiltonian and you can show that actually the eigenvalues of this operator are closely related to the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian according to the particular function that's written here. It's a little bit weird, but they're, they're related in some kind of, some kind of natural way. And so what you can do, because there's this connection between the eigenvalues of this operator you can easily do and the Hamiltonian that you want to simulate, um, you can sort of apply phase estimation to effectively implement the phases that you would like to do to do Hamiltonian simulation, right? So, so somehow what you do is if you're given a sort of an eigenstate corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda, you can kind of phase estimate 
Um, the corresponding eigenvalue of the walk operator, that, so that's this thing that's like arc sine lambda. You get some approximation of that arc sine lambda. And then if you know what arc sine lambda is, well, you, you, that, if, that determines what lambda is. So you can put in the phase you want in Hamiltonian simulation. You know, e to the minus i lambda t is the phase you would, you would put in if you were actually evolving according to the real Hamiltonian. And then you just uncompute the sort of estimate of the phase. Um, and so this, this kind of effectively allows you to implement the Hamiltonian dynamics. And the nice thing about doing things in this way, I mean, it may seem very roundabout because, you know, there was this construction that involved adding an extra, you know, big ancilla register and, um, you know, doing some phase estimation, you know, why not just go directly? But the nice thing is that this gives you a simulation that really just uses a number of steps of the quantum walk and therefore sort of a total amount of time for the simulation that's only linear in the amount of time that the Hamiltonian evolves for. Um, so that's um, that's quite nice, and that shows that you can actually meet the bound that's given by this no fast forwarding theorem. Okay, great. Okay, so that's the kind of first of these post trotter uh, you know simulation methods that I wanted to mention. And next, um, I want to talk about sort of another kind of basic question, which is like, what's the best possible dependence on epsilon that we could hope to have? Right. So. Um, you know, we, we would like to be able to do really, maybe really high precision simulations. We would like to not pay too high a cost to get um, a simulation that's accurate to within epsilon. How much cost do we have to pay as a function of epsilon? Um, and maybe the gold standard, you know, sort of like the thing we would like to hope for is that it could scale like log one over epsilon. There's lots of things you can do sort of that are accurate to within epsilon where the cost scales like log one of epsilon. Like if you want to compute, you know, a, an approximation of pi that's accurate to within epsilon, you can do that, you know, with a cost that's like poly log one of epsilon. If you have like a bounded error subroutine that fails with some small probability, epsilon, some, sorry, with some small probability, and you want to make it fail with some even smaller probability epsilon, um, the cost of getting that scales like logarithmically in one over epsilon. Um, if you want to synthesize a quantum circuit, you know, it's like accurate to within epsilon using the solovey kataev theorem, you know, the cost of doing that scales, you know, polynomially in log one over epsilon. So there are many kinds of things that, you know, if you want to do them sort of accurate to within epsilon, you can get the cost to be only like log one over epsilon. Um, but, um, that's, but that's pretty far from, um, you know, what we get from product formulas. And you can also prove lower bounds on the cost of, um, on the cost of Hamiltonian simulation as a function of epsilon. And it turns out that there's a very, very um, kind of straightforward lower bound using the same kind of construction that we saw before, but now using the fact, not just that parity is hard to compute, but that parity is even hard to compute with unbounded error, right? So if I wanna compute um, the parity of some, some string of n bits, and I wanna be right, you know, not just with like probability close to one, but, I, but if I want to get like any advantage more than a half, right? I could just sort of like guess at random and then, you know, I'd be right maybe with probability half if I had a random input. But if I want to get any advantage over random guessing, um, then, you know, even sort of an exponentially small advantage over random guessing, even that means a number of queries that grows at least linearly in it. So somehow using the hardness of that query problem, you can prove a lower bound on the, um, on the complexity of, of uh, Hamiltonian simulation with error epsilon, and the bound that you get scales something like log one over epsilon. So that says you're not gonna do any better than log one over epsilon, but you know, but how close can we get, right? So, um, so product formulas we saw before um, allow you to get complexity that scales like one over epsilon to, um, you know, to a high power. Um, if we take, a, a, um, uh, if we take uh, you know, the order of the product formula to be, to be large. Um, we have this quantum walk simulation where the cost scales like one over the square root of epsilon. That's not quite as good. Um, but neither of these scalings is as good as, as being like log one over epsilon. So it's kind of similar to the situation we had before where we talked about the dependence on the evolution time. You know, the kind of the simulation methods that we have are nowhere near what we might hope for. So, so can we do better than this? And of course, the answer is yes. Uh, and I'm going to tell you how. So um, the kind of first Hamiltonian simulation method that was developed that showed how to get this uh, logarithmic scaling in, in one over epsilon um, used this idea of implementing a linear combination of unitary operations, um, which is maybe kind of a crazy way to think about doing the simulation on a quantum computer, um, but, it, but it turns out not only to work, but to give this really good epsilon dependence, right? So the idea is somehow what we're gonna do is we're gonna directly implement the Taylor series of the evolution operator. We're gonna somehow directly implement e to the minus iht, thinking of it as a linear combination of 
of operations. Um, and yeah, it sounds kind of crazy because first of all, well, it's not, it's, it's right here. If we look at the Taylor series, it's not a linear combination of unitary operations. It's just a linear combination of a bunch of operators. But even if it were a linear combination of unitary operations, like how would that be a thing we would implement on a quantum computer, right? On quantum computers, we get to multiply together unitary operators. We don't get to add them together, right? So, so it sounds crazy, but, but, you know, bear with me. We're going to, we're going to show that this is actually something we can do. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to truncate the Taylor series. Um, at some, you know, large K so that we kind of have something finite. Um, and you can show that you don't have to take two K, K to be too large to get a good approximation. Um, and, and that's going to relate to sort of the complexity of the method. Basically, 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 it's enough to take K to scale like logarithmically in one over epsilon. And that's kind of where the, the log one over epsilon performance of this method is going to come from. Um, and now I do want to write this thing as a linear combination of unitary operations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine that I can express, first of all, the Hamiltonian as a linear combination of unitary operations. And that, that's not so hard to do. I mean, if it's a local Hamiltonian where you write it as a sum of a tensor product of poly operators, well, poly operators happen to be unitary, so you have such a decomposition. Um, in fact, even if it's a sparse Hamiltonian, you can use these kinds of coloring ideas and some other tricks to write the Hamiltonian as a sum of unitary operators. So this is, you know, this is something that you can get. Um, and then if you plug that expression for the Hamiltonian into the truncated Taylor series, then you get some approximate expression for the evolution operator that's a linear combination of unitary operations. Okay, this is just a mathematical fact. Not, maybe it's not clear why this would be useful, but it turns out to be useful. Um, because of the following sort of result. So suppose you have the ability to do a bunch of unitary operations. Um, and you would like to do a linear combination of those unitary operations, um, then you can do that with a cost that scales like kind of the one norm of the vector of coefficients that you're using to sum up the unitaries, right? So those are these betas, right? So u is the sum of, you know, beta j times vj, kind of the one norm, you know, the sum of the magnitudes of the beta j's basically quantifies the cost of this method that I'm going to tell you about for implementing that linear combination of the vj's. And if this thing that you're trying to do is a unitary operation, or it's a nearly unitary operation, then you can actually do this in a nearly deterministic way. You can get, you can have this procedure just like kind of, you know, work um, almost with certainty, right? I say nearly unitary because we truncated the Taylor series, right? So when we truncate the Taylor series, it's not quite exactly unitary, but uh, it'll be very close to unitary if we're getting a good approximation. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so um, so what are the sort of like, how does this work? So um, the main ideas are, first of all, we're going to have some implementation of U that kind of uh, succeeds with some amplitude. So we're going to sort of map an input state psi together with some ancilla register in the state zero to something that sort of has amplitude, some, some amplitude for applying U. So it's going to be like sine theta for some, for some angle theta. Um, it implements U, but then there's going to be some other amplitude for doing something, something different. And then what we would like to do is we would like to boost the amplitude of the good part, the part in which the operation we want to do really has been applied. And there's a procedure for doing that, that's some kind of generalization of amplitude amplification, which, you know, in turn is some kind of generalization of Grover's algorithm. Um, and it's what we call oblivious amplitude amplification, because it's, it's sort of something like um, amplitude amplification um, for sort of amplifying a, a subroutine. But it's one that works when we're sort of oblivious to the input state because we want to do this kind of regardless of what the input state psi is. Um, so that'll be a little bit more clear when I when I go into more detail about this oblivious amplitude application. Okay, so what I would like to do next is sort of tell you in a little bit more detail, like how we implement this operation u with some with some amplitude, and then how we do this boosting, how this oblivious amplitude amplification works. Uh, okay, but the sort of like kind of what's going to happen, the sort of take home when, when we do these things is that we're going to get an algorithm whose query complexity is quite close to linear in T. It's not exactly linear in T, but it's closer to linear in T than any of the other methods we talked about besides the, the quantum walk method, because it scales kind of like T log T. And the, the dependence on epsilon is going to be like log one over epsilon. In fact, it's going to be like log one over epsilon over log log one over epsilon, which exactly meets this lower bound that I mentioned before. So it has sort of the optimal dependence on epsilon and nearly optimal dependence on T. Okay, so let's let's talk about sort of the kind of technical ideas that go into this a little bit. So let's let's first think about this kind of like partial implementation of U 
right? So we have some, some unitary operation U that we would like to implement or nearly unitary operation U that we would like to implement. And we've expressed it as some linear combination of other unitary operators V sub J, right? U is the sum of beta J times VJ. All right, here's how we're gonna do that. So we're gonna have some operation that's gonna prepare a state of, of an ancillary register that's indexed by, you know, the, the sort of the basis states of this register are gonna be the indices of these, um, you know, these VJs. So they're gonna store these, these J values. Um, and B is gonna be an operation that maps some, you know, standard uh, input state, let's say zero, to a state that encodes the coefficients, the beta j's, um, as the, um, in a state such that the amplitudes of the states are the square roots of the betas, okay? And for this to be a normalized state, we're gonna define this parameter s, which is like the sum of the magnitudes of the betas, right? So the state that's written here is a normalized uh, quantum state. All right, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna define um, an operation which applies B. So this is gonna map zero to this state that encodes the, um, the square roots of the beta J's. And then we're gonna, we're gonna have an operation that applies VJ conditionally on the first register being in the state J. So I'm gonna call this a select V gate. It's a gate that does VJ conditional on the, on the um, Ancela storing J. And then we're gonna unprepare the initial state. We're gonna map you know, the squ square root of beta JJ back to the zero state, okay? So what happens if I, if I apply this operation on my initial state, which is like zero tensor psi? Well, um, so what happens is when I apply, you know, B on zero tensor psi, I prepare the state um, that has the square root of betas in it. And then I, when I apply the select V operation, you know, to that, what's gonna happen is I apply VJ in the part of the superposition where the first register stores J. And then if I think about what happens if I sort of like, you know, project back onto the state that encodes the square root of the betas in it, um, then I'm gonna get exactly um, an amplitude, I'm gonna get exactly, you know, U acting on psi, but with an amplitude of one over S. Right? So, um, so that's just kind of like a, a little calculation that says what happens when I sort of start in the state zero tensor psi, I apply this W operation and I ask how much amplitude do I have to go back to, to um, you know, kind of the part of the space where I have zero in the first register. Um, well, I have, you know, kind of a, um, an amplitude of like one over S and, and when I do that, I've applied the operation U on the second register. Um, yeah, so, so what that kind of tells us, another way of saying this is that if I act with this W operation on zero tensor psi, then um, yeah, I, I have this one over S amplitude to apply U and then, there, there's of course some other part of the space. There's some sort of orthogonal junk, which is, you know, has to have amplitude like square root of one minus one over S squared. Then there's just some state phi where the first register of that state holds something that's orthogonal to the zero uh, for the, for the um, ancilla register, right? It's just some orthogonal state. Yeah. So what are the constraints on the linear combination under which I can do this? Um, so the, the VJ should be unitary. The beta j's should be real numbers. That should like uh, be able to efficiently compute. Well, I'm going to have to be able to to carry out this method. I'm going to have to be able to do this select v operation. So I'm going to need to be able to perform vj, and I'm going to need to be able to do it kind of in a in a um, conditional way, right? So where uh, and I'm going to count up these select v operations, right? So <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna um, yeah, I'm going to have to know like what is the cost of doing this thing where conditional on the first register storing J, I apply VJ in the second register. And what about the, the beta J? And so, yeah, so there it's exactly, exactly an analogous, analogous requirement. I have to be able to do some operation B that prepares that state. Yeah, so, so. Yeah, that's why I can do this for exponentially large sum. Yes, yes. Although I think in the application um, that we're going to look at, maybe it's not going to have to be a very large I mean, I think, I think in the quantum simulation application, actually this state, um, you know, one over square root of S, sum of, over J square root of beta JJ is actually a low dimensional state and you could even prepare it by, by sort of brute force if you had to. Okay, and one more question. Um, given the unitary constraints, are there constraints on the beta J's, on the S parameter? Um, I don't think it's really constrained. I mean, I think in principle, it could be pretty big. Um, and if it is pretty big, that's going to translate into there being a high cost for the 
for the simulation. I mean, actually, in the Hamiltonian simulation method that I'm going to describe, you can sort of think about doing evolutions for fairly short amounts of time, such that the S is not too big and you're going to string them together. But I think as far as a, as a general method is concerned, like it could be could be small, it could be big. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, S is a state or oh, sorry, S is a S is a number, and it's a number that sort of quantifies something about the um, the coefficients in this linear combination of of uh, unitaries. It's just the one norm of those of those coefficients, right? So it's the sum of the magnitude of the beta j's, and that's a yeah. It's something characterizing that linear combination of unitaries. Yes. Okay, good. Other questions? Okay. All right. So, um, so, so now we've seen how to kind of like partially implement U, but now we want to see how to boost it, right? So we have an amplitude one over S for doing U, but we would like to do it with amplitude one. Right? We would like to just be doing U. So we're just doing the evolution. Um, and this, so this task that we would like to do, you know, it's sort of like amplitude amplification. Like we have some amplitude for getting the thing that we want. We want to make that amplitude bigger. But we have an unknown initial state, right? So, you know, the way amplitude amplification works is you alternate between these reflections about kind of the subspace you want to get to and the um, state that you started from. But in this application, we don't know what state we started from. We want to be able to do Hamiltonian simulation on an unknown initial state. So that's that's kind of a challenge. We want to somehow be oblivious to that initial state. But it turns out that if you just kind of do something that's very much analogous to um, uh, you know, that's very much analogous to um, the way amplitude amplification would work, but just sort of trying to amplify a subspace, it turns out to work. And the reason for that, I mean, it's closely related to this kind of QMA amplification procedure of, of Marriott and Watrous, if you, if you know that. Anyway, let me just sort of describe how it works. Um, so uh, let me just define some notation. So P is going to be a projector onto the zero state in the Ancilla register. And R is going to be like the reflection about that zero state for the Ancilla register, you know, tensored with the identity for the kind of the main register. Um, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at what happens when we apply this operator. So first I do W. W is the thing that, um, so W is the thing that kind of partially implements U, right? It's the thing that creates one over S, uh, you know, zero tensor U, but then it, it's zero tensor U psi, but then it um, has this some orthogonal junk. And then the remaining piece of this, this thing that we're going to apply this, you know, W R W dagger R, this is like the thing that's analogous to the, the iteration that you apply in amplitude amplification. It's like, um, it's some reflection, but now it's the reflection about the subspace in which you have the zero state for the ancilla. And then it's that thing conjugated by W and that's kind of the analog of the reflection about the, um, the marked subspace in amplitude amplification. So anyway, there's just a little calculation you can do. Um, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe in the interest of time, I won't sort of like go through it, but what happens very much parallels what would happen if you would do the calculation for amplitude amplification. Um, but now what you get is some uh, linear combination of sort of applying U and applying U, U dagger U, which of course, if U is exactly unitary, that's just U. And if U is close to unitary, well, that's close to U. Um, and so what you see is that, um, uh, yeah, so if u is approximately unitary, you get you get this thing. You get sort of some some coefficient times u, um, and if um, if for example s equals two, then you can just do the calculation here. I guess you know three over two is one point five. Four over two cubed is you know, 0.5. So right, that that coefficient then would be one if s is equal to two. And so what happens if s is exactly two is that you boost the amplitude from a half to be exactly one. And, and so this is exactly the same thing that happens in one out of four search, if you, if you know the analysis of Grover's algorithm, right? If you, um, if you have like one marked item out of four possible items, um, then one step of the Grover iteration takes you from uh, sort of having an amplitude one half on the marked state to having an amplitude one on the marked state. Right? The, the Grover algorithm with, with a unique marked item actually takes you, you know, exactly to the marked item in, uh, in one iteration in the case where the search space has size four. So that's, this is kind of like the analog of that. And more generally, what's happening is you're, you're sort of boosting the amplitude in exactly the way that you do um, in amplitude amplification. If you have a larger value of S, you can actually um, continue to iterate, continue to apply this W R W dagger R operation, and it will um, you know, continue to boost the amplitude for you. Uh, and you can make it you know, close to one after some larger number of iterations. 
Okay, so this is the way that you can take this implementation, this kind of partial implementation of you, and you can make it sort of an ideal implementation of you. Yes. Yeah, so the, the question is about the value of S. So um, the value of S really depends a lot on the context in which you're, you're using this. So in Hamiltonian simulation, what you can do is you can sort of like, when we're applying this to Hamiltonian simulation, we can take the times over which we evolve to be small enough that S is exactly two. We just sort of like choose the parameters so that S is two, right? Because if we're simulating for short amounts of time, it's going to make the error in the sort of, um, you know, operation that we're, between the operation we're trying to do and the ideal evolution, it's going to make it, it's going to make it smaller. So by taking a, a short enough evolution time, we can actually make S exactly two so that one step of this oblivious amplitude amplification will make it perfect. And then we can just repeat that, right? Um, over and over again. Um, and, you know, the sort of like accumulation of error is not so bad because it's going to be, you know, the sort of quality of the, I mean, truncating this Taylor series uh, introduces only a really small amount of error. So, um, so then you can, you can just sort of like choose a, a convenient parameter so that S is not too big. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you would, um, if you would sort of try to use this in other contexts, it could be that S is much larger. And then there is a, there is a procedure for trying to sort of uh, amplify it by, you know, here I just analyzed what happens when you do one step of this ability amplitude amplification, but you certainly can do it in contexts where S is bigger if you want to use it um, there. Yeah. Good. Other questions? Okay, great. So, right. So um, I want to talk about kind of one more uh, post-trotter method um, and I'm going to motivate that with this question about the trade-off between T and epsilon in the cost of Hamiltonian simulation, right? So now we have sort of an, a method that's optimal with respect to T. We have another method that's optimal with respect to epsilon and like almost, you know, close to optimal with respect to T. Um, but what about the trade-off, right? What if we have, you know, we have these two parameters. It would be nice to have the query complexity that gets the best possible trade-off between T and epsilon. Right. And so, um, you know, we have an upper bound, for example, from this linear combination of unitary stuff that I just told you about an upper bound that goes like T log T over epsilon over log log T over epsilon. Um, uh, on the other, on the lower bound side, we have a linear in T lower bound. We have a, we have a log one over epsilon over log log one over epsilon lower bound. So, you know, the, whatever's the maximum of those is, is a lower bound. As far as the asymptotic performance goes, that's the same as the sum of those two things is a, is a lower bound. Um, but um, these two things are not the same, right? One of them sort of involves T, combines T and epsilon additively. One of them is sort of multiplicative. Um, so, you know, where is the truth? What's the sort of like best trade-off between T and epsilon that you, um, you know, can actually get with the best, um, the best possible simulation method? And it turns out that it's the, the truth is closer to the lower bound. And there's another Hamiltonian simulation method that was developed that, that shows how to, how to achieve this. Actually, there's a slightly better lower bound than this that you can prove, and the method actually achieves that slightly better lower bound. So the truth is in between these two things, but much closer to the lower bound side. Okay, so uh, this alternative method um, uses this idea called quantum signal processing. So this was, um, you know, introduced by Guang Hao Lo and Ai Tuang uh, around 2016. Um, and sort of the main idea of this method is to somehow encode um, information about the eigenvalues of H into some two-dimensional subspace using something they call qubitization, um, and then use some um, kind of carefully chosen sequence of single qubit rotations that I'll tell you about in a minute to somehow manip manip uh, manipulate those eigenvalues to give you the evolution operator, e to the minus IHT. Um, and so I'm going to explain on the next several slides um, how, this, how this kind of works. Um, now, this, this quantum signal processing transformation that implements the the sort of transformation to the eigenvalues that you would like to do um, involves a kind of uh, compilation step, a kind of classical uh, pre-processing that um, is kind of a hard calculation, a kind of a hard computation. It's um, something that can be done efficiently. So the, there's a nice paper by Ha where he shows, um, you know, uh, rigorously that this can be done efficiently. Um, and there's some, some other nice uh, recent work showing how to do this kind of faster. Um, but yeah, this is one of the challenges of this method is that actually, you know, computing this signal processing transformation is, is not so easy, but it's something we're sort of understanding um, better and better as time goes on. Um, 
And the other thing that I just want to mention is that this, this idea of quantum signal processing and sort of a more general thing that's been developed called, called quantum singular value transformation gives you a framework that you can apply to other problems, not just Hamiltonian simulation, but you can sort of use it for designing other quantum algorithms. And that's something that's um, yeah, been explored in, in recent work. And I think there's, there's definitely more to, um, more to do using these methods kind of as an algorithm tool. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think in general, if you have a lower bound of, you know, this or that, you can get this kind of additive lower bound. Um, although actually they're almost the same construction for this, right? I mean, they were, they sort of both use the hardness of parity. One of them uses the kind of bounded error hardness of parity and the other uses the like unbounded error hardness of parity. So, um, in, in this case, I think they actually follow from basically the same construction. Yeah. Okay, great. Other questions? Yes. Did you use the average Hamiltonian theory to help with the computation of the equation? Oh, um, uh, I, I don't know specifically. I mean, the um, yeah, there's there's sort of like algebraic methods that go into the kind of you know Haas construction. Some of these recent approaches that I mentioned use sort of like ideas from optimization. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know specifically about the methods that you're talking about, but maybe we could discuss. After I think I think it is a nice question to give like better algorithms for this, yeah. And I think there was another question. Maybe there's several. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's like a symptomatic like analysis, but it's also hard to grasp like, how large you thought it should be. Yes. Is there an example of like a pretty um, simulated usable phenomenon? Like, how large? The yes. Yes. Um, uh, absolutely. Yeah. That's the, there's the paper that we wrote that's basically about exactly that, and there's a reference to it at the end. So, I mean, I would say what we, you know, so when we wrote that paper, like we did not have this theory of Trotter error that sort of allows us to um, estimate the, um, you know, analytically the performance of product formulas, but we had sort of empirical estimates that, that um, I think give you the sort of the right scaling. And basically the conclusion of that work for an example that we looked at, which was some kind of simple simulation of a spin model was that you should use product formulas. So, you know, these, these fancy methods that we're talking about now, at least for that application, seemed not to, um, although I would say they have, it's not that they have enormous constants, like they have actually relatively low overhead. They don't, they don't have to use that many more in qubits. That's also a concern, but they don't use that many more in qubits. Um, they have pretty good constants, but still the product formulas work so well that at least for that example that we looked at, you know, using like fourth or maybe sixth order product formulas were sort of the right thing to do for some kind of spin system with tens of qubits. I mean, of course, there's lots of things you might want to simulate. So for some other system, you know, the conclusion could be different, but the, we did one study and that was the conclusion of that. So I would say, yeah, I mean, these methods that we're talking about now, like um, it's not clear how useful they're going to be in practice. I think there's definitely more we have to do to understand that better. Yeah. And then I think there were maybe a couple of other questions. Yeah. Maybe you explain this. Oh, I, I haven't explained it. I'm going to explain it on the next couple of slides. Yeah, you didn't miss it. Yeah. Good. Are there other questions? Okay, great. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about how um, you know how how these quantum signal processing methods work. Okay, so um, they're based on this kind of powerful idea, which also goes into these this more general, you know, uh, quantum singular value transformation stuff that I mentioned, uh, you know, it's based on this power, rather powerful idea of what's called block encoding. So a block encoding of an operator is just like a representation of that operator as a sub block of a unitary matrix, right? So let's say we have um, some operator A, it could be maybe the Hamiltonian that we want to block encode, or maybe the uh, evolution of the Hamiltonian that we want to block encode. We're going to encode that as like the top left part of some unitary matrix. And so, yeah, we'll say that if we can write A as the top left block of a unitary matrix U, then we say that U block encodes A, right? So, um, of course, for this to be the case, there's some constraints, like A has to have spectral norm at most one, otherwise you won't be able to put it inside a block of a unitary matrix. But that's basically the only constraint, right? As long as the spectral norm of A is at most one, you could put it as some block of U and then fill out, you know, the rest of U in some way so that U is overall a unitary matrix. Okay, so we've actually already seen this. Um, somehow this idea was kind of implicit in this LCU, this linear combination of unitaries approach to Hamiltonian simulation. 
um, you know, we had this operator W, which was like the thing that we, um, the thing that we sort of applied to partially implement um, the, the um, operator U that we, that we wanted to perform in the linear combination of unitaries. Right? It was like B dagger select VB. That was a block encoding of U over S, right? Because it sort of had U over S in its top left block, you know, the block corresponding to having the zero state for the ancillary register. And then it had some other stuff in the, in the other parts of the matrix. And then, you know, basically oblivious amplitude amplification was a way of taking that block encoding and like boosting the, um, you know, S to one, right? Boosting it so that we actually had just U sitting in the top left block. So taking a block encoding of U over S and making it into a block encoding of, of U without the scaling down. Um, okay, and you know, block encodings can be constructed, um, you know, for lots of nice operators. And in particular, if you have a sparse matrix, so if you have like a sparse Hamiltonian, you want to simulate, um, you can directly give a kind of block encoding of it in terms of operations that are easy to implement using a black box for this sparse matrix. Um, so there, there is these kind of row and column unitary operators that are written here, such that you know, R dagger C will give you a block encoding of. Um, not exactly of A, but of A over D, right? So in general, in block encodings, there may be this scaling down, and then you may have to use oblivious amplitude amplification to scale back up uh, in, in some contexts. But, um, but anyway, you can, if you have a sparse matrix, you can block encode. It. And so sort of understanding what things you can efficiently block encode and how you can manipulate block encodings, you know, gives you a big sort of toolbox for thinking about implementing unitary operations efficiently, and it's useful in particular for this Hamiltonian simulation context. Okay, so this is how to sort of like, you know, think about block encoding the matrix, but now we would like to have some kind of transformations that we can apply to turn a block encoding of something into sort of, uh, you know, some other desired but related operator. And that's where this idea of quantum signal processing comes in, right? So the general problem here is that we've got a block encoding of some matrix A, and we would like to turn it into a block encoding of some other function of A. And we wanna know like, what are the functions that we could apply and how would we do that? And, th and this is where this computing these angles is going to um, come in, right? We, we're going to have to figure out what are these angles going to have to be um, that are going to implement some desired function. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about just sort of block encoding of a scalar. And then there's this other thing that I'm going to mention on the next slide, qubitization, that's going to be how we deal with, um, you know, larger matrices. But for now, imagine that A is actually just a, a scalar. It's just a one by one matrix. So it's just a number X. Um, and so here's a block encoding of, of a scalar. We can just consider this matrix that has X in the top left corner. And I've just filled out the rest of the matrix so that it's actually a unitary matrix. Okay. Um, uh, by the way, these slides are on my website. If you don't, you don't have to take pictures. If you, if you want, you can find them on my, the um, page of talks on my website. Um, okay, so, um, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of do some sequence of operations that's gonna allow us to transform W. Um, so we're going to sort of alternate between doing W and doing a, a Z rotation parameterized by some angle uh, on this space. And we're going to ask, like, what are the kinds of operators that we can get by sort of um, alternately applying W and doing some Z rotation? Um, so that's, that's kind of the question. What functions of W can we real, realize in this way by choosing these angles? Uh, and it turns out that this, um, this, the answer to this problem had actually been characterized in, in an earlier paper of Lo and Chuang together with um, Ted Yoder. Um, and they sort of like described what are the functions that you can, you can implement by these quantum, this quantum signal processing. Here I have a statement of, of sort of version of this lemma taken from this quantum singular value transformation paper that came later. But you know, basically the, the characterization of these things goes back to this Lo, Yoder, and Chuang paper. Um, and so what they showed was that basically you can implement sort of any function um, so there's some conditions that kind of obviously have to be satisfied by a function that you can implement in this way. And basically you can implement any function that satisfies these obvious conditions, right? So like if you, so this F is gonna be um, a polynomial, uh, it's kind of easy to see. And if you, if you have a sequence that involves K uses of U, then this F um, can be a polynomial of degree at most K. And this G has to, you can show has to have degree at most K minus one. Um, and there's some parity conditions that have to do with some symmetries here. And there's some um, you know, constraint on the kind of um, square of F and the square of G that sort of you can, you can easily show have to be satisfied by any such transformation. And then what you can show is that actually any polynomials F and G that satisfy these conditions um, you know, can be implemented by some choice of angles, 
right? So this lemma is like an existence statement. It's not a construction of what those angles are. And that gets into this question about how do you actually find the angles to implement some transformation that you want to do? But there's an algorithm for doing that. Um, actually, I mean, I should say that, so, so these angles are only functions of the transformation you want to apply. They're not a function of, you know, the matrix that you're applying the transformation on, right? So in the Hamiltonian simulation context, they're not a function of the simulation you're trying to do, of the, you know, the Hamiltonian you're trying to simulate. They're just a function of the transformation you want to apply. And that's, like, that's actually just some fixed thing. So actually, I mean, you don't necessarily even need an algorithm to compute what the angles are. It's possible you could just write down in closed form what the angles should be for the transformation you want to do for a Hamiltonian simulation. That's actually a nice problem. Like I wish someone would solve that so we don't have to use these compilers anymore and we would just know what are the, what are the angles that we want to apply. Okay, uh, anyway, um, so, so now we have this kind of quantum signal processing idea. So now we would like to use this in a way that's useful for Hamiltonian simulation, you know, not just for some one dimensional operators but for high dimensional operators. And um, that's where this idea of qubitization comes in. So if we want to perform this quantum signal processing on a high dimensional block encoding, we can do it effectively by doing quantum signal processing on a qubit through this qubitization procedure. So here, here's how that works. So um, we're going to imagine that we have some block encoding of a high dimensional matrix. Um, so what that means is that, is that you know, the top left block of, of, um, of, of U is A. So you can think about that in terms of like projecting out that top left block. If pi is like the projector onto the part of the space where this, um, you know, this bold zero um, state is the state of the of the um, first register, then um, then you know pi a pi should be basically like you know the state that tells you that you're in the top left block um, projector onto that tensored with a, um, and. So now what you can do is like, you know, think about a state that has this zero state in the first register and just, um, you know, some eigenvector of A in the second register. Um, and what you can show is that U um, maps between two two dimensional, two, between some two dimensional subspaces, um, uh, you know, in a nice way. So basically, if you like think about states in the span of this state lambda and, uh, you know, some other state that you can derive from lambda, um, you know, you map states within that two-dimensional subspace to some other related two-dimensional subspace. So basically, I mean, the details don't matter so much here, but you can identify some two-dimensional subspaces so that U is acting within those two-dimensional subspaces exactly like this one-dimensional block encoding that we saw on the previous slide. So somehow, um, you know, what you can do is you can sort of just think about performing quantum signal processing on this high-dimensional operator in a way that's very analogous to the quantum signal processing that we saw on the last slide for the kind of the one dimensional block encoding. Um, and so this will then allow us to kind of realize general functions of an operator A using sort of exactly the conditions that we saw in the, the one dimensional quantum signal processing lemma. Okay, so there's, I mean, there's a lot of details to get into here. I have some references, you know, later if you want to sort of look into this in more detail, but I'm trying to give you sort of the, the high level view. Okay, so now what you can do is you can use this to perform Hamiltonian simulation. And how are we going to do that? Well, imagine we're given some block encoding of a matrix H that are Hamiltonian. That could be, maybe it's a sparse matrix. So we do that sparse block encoding that I mentioned before. And now we're gonna turn that into a block encoding of E to the minus IHT, right? If it's a block encoding of E to the minus IHT, actually we know there are gonna have to be zeros sort of in the, you know, the top right and bottom left blocks because that's actually a unitary operator. So if we can block encode that, it's really just gonna be sitting there in the top left uh, kind of corner of our, of our matrix. And it's gonna allow us to just apply E to the minus IHT, you know, unitarily to some unknown input state. Um, and so now what we have to do is we have to perform some quantum signal processing to implement the transformation that turns the block encoding of H into the block encoding of E to the minus IHT. Um, and it turns out that you can construct such a thing using this formula called um, the Jacobi-Anger formula, which allows you to sort of write, you know, the exponential of, you know, e, so e to the itx as some linear combination involving, you know, Bessel functions and, and uh, Chebyshev polynomials. Um, and, you know, um, you can truncate this thing to give a kind of, um, you know, a polynomial that you would like to implement by quantum signal processing. So now we have some polynomial. And now we can go back to that, um, that lemma that I showed before to figure out um, you know, that there should exist a way of doing quantum signal processing to perform this transformation using you know, capital K steps. 
Um, and then actually finding the angles that implement that, okay, that's a challenge, but, um, but hopefully something that we can, I mean, it's definitely something that we can compute classically with an efficient algorithm. Um, and it turns out that the K that you need to take um, to get a good approximation is, gonna, is one that's gonna give us a quantum simulation algorithm that achieves this optimal trade-off that scales more like the, the, the sum of T and log one over epsilon than like the product of T and log one over epsilon. So this really gives us in some kind of, at least in some kind of abstract sense, a um, kind of uh, quantum simulation algorithm with a, like optimal dependence on both of these parameters, you know, including the way that they, that they um, you know, trade off between each other, um, you know, to give us the best possible query complexity. Um, so yeah, there's some kind of technical issue here that, um, you know, because of the way this lemma works, you can only get a block encoding of like e to the minus IHT over two directly out of this lemma, but then you can use oblivious amplitude amplification to kind of boost this up to e to the minus IHT. So that's not a problem. You can really, you know, nearly deterministically, uh, you know, perform the Hamiltonian simulation. Um, and it achieves this optimal trade-off. Okay, so the, uh, yeah. yeah. I'm just curious, if, if you can calculate the angles efficiently yeah. why are you calling it uh, right. So, right. So there's a, there's an efficient algorithm, but it's, um, you know, it, the running time is not, is not great in practice. Like, so um, if you want to, you know, compute the, um, you know, you can have algorithms that run in polynomial time, but they have bad, bad constants or bad scaling with, uh, you know, the input size that, that make them not so, not so feasible. So I think if you want to, um, you know, if you would want to produce the, the angles that would allow you to do a, um, you know, even a simulation of like a hundred spin system, you know, acting for some amount of time, it was maybe sort of like proportional to the number of spins. I think that would be challenging. Like you probably couldn't do it on a laptop. Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, okay, yeah, so, and as, as I mentioned, you know, when uh, uh, you were asking before about the kind of practical utility of these methods, like I'm not sure that there's a case where this quantum signal processing method, although it has this nice, you know, trade-off that's really optimal and in some senses, um, you know, achieving, in some sense, it's the optimal algorithm, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing to use in practice. And, and my sense is that maybe, you know, for, for most applications, uh, you know, product formulas, which are a lot simpler, uh, you know, will, will actually be also better, to, um, better in terms of the, the performance that they achieve in practice for small size instances. But I still think this is a sort of a tool worth knowing about and, and thinking about for, for future applications. Okay, so um, in the kind of last bit of the talk, I wanted to talk a little bit about some kind of uh, selected topics related to uh, Hamiltonian simulation. Uh, we don't have to do all of this, but maybe maybe let's talk about some of it. Um, starting with uh, the problem of simulating Hamiltonians with spatially local interactions, right? So if we have some realistic system, it's not just going to be described by a Hamiltonian that's you know k-local in the kind of abstract sense I said before that the terms act on um, you know act non-trivially on at most some uh, you know, bounded number of spins, um, those spins are going to be near each other in the lattice. And maybe we can take advantage of that information to give a more efficient simulation. Um, so, um, you know, in particular, so you know, let's, let's think about exactly the situation. So imagine we have, let's say, n spins with nearest neighbor interactions on a, on a finite dimensional grid. And now um, let's think about, you know, what is the cost of simulating such a system? Um, so if you use um, the kind of most of the methods that I've described so far, um, the kind of linear combination of unitaries method, the quantum signal processing method, or even higher order product formulas where you use kind of the standard analysis, not the theory of Trotter error analysis that I mentioned, but kind of the, the old school analysis, then um, those methods all use a total number of gates, um, you know, to simulate, to do a simulation for, let's say, um, a constant time they'll use a total number of gates that scales like n squared and like the depth of the circuit for doing the simulation will scale like the system size. So this feels like not so great, right? Because somehow the system is simulating its own dynamics, you know, for constant time, sort of doing a constant amount of work, right? It's only taking sort of constant depth of the evolving of the system to, to do the evolving of the system for constant time, right? The execution time somehow should not have to be you know, extensive, right? The circuit depth seems like it, it ought to be something that you could make only, you should be able to make only constant, whereas in these methods, all of these methods, it's scaling like N. Um, and it turns out that you actually can give a simulation that achieves sort of like the constant depth 
uh, costs that you that you think ought to be possible. This was shown in a very nice paper by uh, this group at Microsoft, Ha Hastings, Kothari, and Lowe, um, and they showed that somehow by using information from Lee Robinson bounds, which characterize how fast information can propagate in quantum systems, um, they could sort of like design a simulation that involves simulations of small subregions of the of the uh, system. And then some like you combine those with some negative time evolutions that sort of do some corrections at the boundaries between these regions. Um, you know, overall, they were able to do, to do this to give a simulation that had, um, you know, nearly the optimal performance that somehow if you want to simulate for these lattice systems, you wanted to simulate for constant time, you can do that with a depth that's sort of close to constant. Um, so this is very nice. And since many of the systems we actually want to simulate in practice, um, you know, we'll, we'll have um, this kind of spatial locality. You know, maybe this is a really important idea for, for the kinds of systems that we would like to simulate. Um, but it turns out that actually product formulas achieve nearly the same performance if you use the kind of um, modern analysis that we, that we have for these methods. So, um, you know, if you use the kind of old school analysis, you get, you get something where, you know, um, you have this um, higher cost. Um, but if you use this improved analysis using commutator scaling, then you get something that's very close to the, this um, Aha at all uh, scaling. So, um, you know, we, we remember we have this parameter alpha that characterizes the cost of the simulation in terms of norms of nested commutators. And um, this quantity is, is something that we can bound. So if we have, you know, a, a lattice in constant dimension and we consider product formulas of constant order, so constant P, then this quantity alpha you can show is linear in N because basically, you know, consider like the, these indices, if we fix some index J1, okay, there's some, there's some, uh, you know, corresponding term in the Hamiltonian. So that corresponds to some, you know, bond on the lattice, right? Some adjacent pair of spins. Um, and how many other terms are there that have a non-zero commutator with it? Well, it's only the bonds that share a spin, right? If it's on a 2D lattice, maybe there's some that look like this, you know, over here and down here, but it's only some constant number. Right, and every time we, we nest the commutator out one more, okay, the region is going to grow, but it's going to if we only do this some constant number of times because we're only considering commutator uh, nested commutators out to constant depth, we're only going to get some constant number of turns. Right, so for a fixed J one, we're only going to get some constant number of contributions. Um, uh, you know, I mean, there's maybe some exponential growth in P, and maybe even I'm not sure exactly what the growth is with the dimension of the lattice, but if we fix the dimension of the lattice and we fixed P, fixed P. Um, for any fixed J1, we're just going to get some constant number of terms. So overall, we're going to get a number of terms that scales like the number of spins in the lattice. So if we sort of work out the consequences of this, what you find is that you get a cost that scales like n to the, you know, 1 plus 1 over p. So that's, you know, for, for large p, that's sort of close to the scaling of the, um, you know, these, this ha et al uh, algorithm. And I think in practice, probably that, I'm not sure to what extent this has been explored, but I think in practice, probably the product formulas are going to work better unless your system gets really big. Okay, uh, great. So um, the next kind of special topic I wanted to mention was this notion of interaction picture simulation. Maybe in light of the time, I won't go through it in great detail and just say that um, uh, you know there are cases where you want to simulate some time independent Hamiltonian, but it's actually useful to do to use a simulation of time dependent dynamics, you know, time dependent Hamiltonian dynamics as a subroutine in doing that simulation. If you can write your Hamiltonian as a sum of terms, where maybe one of the terms is very large, so um, it would be sort of a high cost in combining it in a product formula, let's say, um, but that term is easy to simulate, then it can be useful to go into the interaction picture of that mm -hmm. large but easy to simulate term, uh, and this can give more efficient simulations. So. Uh, yeah, maybe in the interest of time, I'll just leave it there. But there are some some situations where you know it can be useful to use this interaction picture simulation. Um, yeah, maybe I'll also go very quickly through um, this idea of randomized simulation, just to say that there are there are cases where you can give a quantum algorithm for simulating Hamiltonian dynamics, where sort of making random choices of of um, you know kind of what term to apply in your simulation um, can be fruitful. So maybe I'll just quickly do this example, um, which kind of shows that, so remember if we want to try to get, um, you know, kind of like a, a um, second order approximation to the, to the um, um, 
to the time evolution operator. Well, so here's the Taylor series out to second order. And remember that if we just do, you know, if we just do, e, we just do A first and then B, or if we just do B first and then A, somehow we're limited in this second order term to have the order, you know, be only A, B or only B, A. So there's no way of getting the right second order term. Um, but actually if you, so they, they differ here at second order, but if you consider the, um, all, all, consider exchanging the order of B and A, then you can get that term with A and B in the other order. So maybe something you can do is try to sort of at random either apply A first and then B or B first and then A. Uh, and you can do this to kind of effectively get a second order approximation, but now you need to kind of think about, um, uh, you know, now you're really sort of applying some unitary operation at random. So you're really doing some quantum operation and you have to start doing your sort of um, uh, error analysis in terms of the diamond norm of, of this operation. So let me maybe sort of like skip the details, but just say that there are, there are cases here where we're applying different evolutions at random, um, you know, can, can sometimes um, sort of allow you to do things that you couldn't do if you sort of like have to fix uh, some unitary, some particular unitary operation you're going to use to do the simulation. And there's a nice kind of like um, alternative way of doing simulation using randomness that was proposed by Earl Campbell, which he called Q drift. It's some kind of uh, quantum analog of stochastic drift, I think is where the, where the name comes from, um, where he chooses which term of the Hamiltonian to simulate with a probability that depends on the weight with which it appears in the, um, in the Hamiltonian. So if you have a Hamiltonian that's a sum of terms, maybe some of them have larger weight than others, um, then somehow by choosing which terms to simulate with probabilities that scale with those weights, um, you can give a simulation that sometimes has favorable performance. Um, yeah, again, maybe let me just sort of skip to the kind of um, uh, conclusion at the end. So the sort of downside of this method is that it kind of only allows you to achieve first order approximations. So um, you know, eventually, once once higher order methods are are worth doing, um, you know, uh, they they will perform better than than this QDRIFT method. Um, but it has some other nice features. Um, there, it really has no sort of like explicit dependence on the number of terms in the Hamiltonian. So if you're really limited by having a large number of terms that you need to simulate, but some of them are much bigger than others, then this kind of random sampling of which terms you simu simulate uh, or which terms you simulate more than which other terms. Um, you know, can give you sometimes much better performance. So this is another kind of uh, interesting sort of post-trotter method um, that uses this additional ingredient of um, choosing at random what to simulate. Okay, so this um, maybe leaves just a little bit of time for kind of some brief outlook. Um, actually, yeah, there were some great questions, um, you know, throughout the talk, which actually already touched on some of the things that I was going to mention. Um, I think that there are both like really interesting questions about sort of further development of algorithms and also really interesting questions and maybe more interesting and more important questions about how to apply these algorithms in applications. So, I mean, as far as these algorithmic questions go, you know, there's lots of scope for potentially improving the kind of Hamiltonian simulation algorithms that we've been talking about. Um, you know, we could, we can always try to sort of have, you know, better analysis of, of these methods, but you know, maybe we can sort of like um, use different product formulas to get, um, you know, better performance. Um, or, you know, another sort of interesting direction is to think about using sort of structure of your Hamiltonian to try to give more efficient algorithms, right? So we already saw an example of that where we can give, we can take advantage of spatial locality to give faster um, simulation, but maybe there are other features of Hamiltonians that we care to simulate um, that allow us to develop, um, you know, faster methods. Um, you know, I think this idea of sort of using quantum simulation as an algorithmic tool to develop other algorithms for problems not directly re related to simulation is, um, you know, a really interesting direction. And I think there's a lot more to explore there. Um, and I also mentioned this direction of sort of applying quantum simulation as a theoretical tool. You know, maybe we can use that to prove better area laws or Lee Robinson bounds, or, you know, basically to get a better handle on um, various aspects of physics. I think that's an interesting kind of thing um, to try to do. But I think, yeah, really the thing that for me, I would like to explore more um, and, and that I think, you know, deserves more attention, although, I mean, it's received a lot of attention, but I think deserves more attention um, is to really think about in concrete terms, you know, how are we going to apply these, these abstract algorithms to simulate uh, physics or chemistry or, you know, models that we, that we care about. I think there's a lot of kind of, um, you know, details of these particular applications that need to be taken into account. A lot more we can understand about how in concrete terms 
these algorithms will perform when we try to use them for those applications. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there are also these questions that came up about, you know, what we can do for noisy systems. You know, is there anything we can do before we have fault tolerance? Uh, and what can we say about how algorithms perform in, in the presence of noise? So I think these are all really interesting questions. Uh, and for me, like the kind of overall goal that I think, you know, I hope will drive a lot of the work in this area, um, which I think hasn't been evident in the stuff that I've talked about, because I've told you about the things that I know, but the things that I would like to know uh, more about um, are really how to, you know, in very concrete terms, apply these algorithms to real applications. Um, so that's that's something that, you know, I would like to learn more about from uh, from from all of you, and hopefully we have a chance to talk about um, you know during the, the workshop coming up. And it's something that I hope um, you know through RQS we can we can learn a lot more about how we actually apply quantum simulators to answer uh, interesting questions. Uh, okay, so um, so that's uh, basically what I wanted to cover. Just on this last slide, I have some references for further reading. Um, there's some kind of lecture notes and kind of overviews um, that you can look that you can uh, read if you're interested in some of these topics. Uh, and also I have links to a bunch of talks um, that cover various aspects of quantum simulation that you might be interested in watching if you want to see other perspectives on, on some of the things that we've talked about. And uh, yeah, there's a link to this um, presentation on the talks page on my website if you want to, um, you know, you don't have to try to write down these links, you can, you can find it there. Okay, thanks very much.